In this deep dive, we are going to talk about how to get from an unstructured training environment built on scripts and GPython notebooks to a well-structured, well-organized environment which favors reusability and reproducibility. We're going to talk about how we can do that in small steps which can be incorporated into the daily deliveries. But before that, we're going to take a look at the anatomy of a training environment and define the different parts of it so that we can discuss around it. What I will focus on now is aimed towards companies that has already monetized their deep learning but where the deep learning itself is in a quite ad hoc and labor intensive state. What I mean with monetized deep learning is that we have value propositions coming in, a clear view on what problem we actually want to solve. And then we perform our data analytics and um, training. And after that, we have the deployment and we have the serving that will actually expose these models to the real environment where we can collect feedback on how it worked and if our assumptions was correct or not. If you're in a research setting, this might look a little bit different, but the core idea is the same, that you do some kind of delivery, either by the model or by the results, and you get some kind of feedback that tells you how you actually um, made with your assumptions. But let's go on to the training environment. At the very core of the environment, we have the training itself. And this is the training, this is the evaluation, this is the hyperparameter tuning, and all these core things regarding the actual um, training of the model. And we can define some different inputs to this training. We have the data sets, the actual data that we train on and the data that we validate on. We have the architectures, the different network architectures that we are using. And we have the configurations, the hyperparameters, the loss functions, and all the different settings that we might want to change in between different runs to see what gives us the best result. And the outcome of this is the models, the trained models with weights, biases, accurate results and other properties. You don't normally see this kind of clear separation between the different parts. For example, the architectures might be mixed in together with the training code. The configuration might be spread all over the code base. But there are some, some nice things about actually doing this kind of separation. For example, one thing is that if you're if you're in an industry where you suddenly see a new disruption and you find a new need for some kind of new detector, for example, it might be that previously you have trained your face detection algorithms and now you see a sudden need for face mask detection instead. If you have a good separation here, you can just add a new data set and you can add a new configuration and you can use exactly the same code and environment to train the new product, which means that you will have the new product out fast and with low cost. So now we will have two different models that are the outputs that will actually go into production. And you might have even more models on an experimentation stage that you have not yet promoted to production. Other benefits of actually doing this kind of separation is testability. 
for example, it makes it much easier to write different test cases for the data sets, write different test cases for the combination of configurations and so forth. Sooner or later you will however find that there is a limit to how much abstraction you want to have in your uh, classes. So when actually implementing this, you can define it in different ways. You could define your data sets in JSON, your configuration in YAML, architectures in YAML and so forth. I would probably not recommend this as it's not really general, generalizable enough for most people. You could also implement everything as code. So you could have your data set as Python classes, which exposes the data API. You can have the architectures as Python implementation of the architectures and the configuration as Python objects that you inject into your training pipeline. The training pipeline itself could be separated into different elements which you by your configuration can choose to use or not use. This would allow to train a bit different kind of detectors with the same environment and the same pipeline. So for example if you're training key point detectors you can have data sets with different amount of key points. For example, person posts might have uh, 11 or 17 key points. Well, you can have bounding boxes based on the Sentinet implementation, which has um, only three key points or two key points. And you can have single key point detectors detecting the head of a person, detecting the face mask uh, and so forth. And this could all be abstracted in the pipeline based on the configuration. But for example, if you want to do instance segmentation or segmentic segmentation, then this pipeline might not be the correct place to put it because the generalization would cause more problems than it would bring value. So in that case, you can duplicate this whole surrounding environment and we have different environments for different products or different uses. And the nice thing about implementing all the things in code is that now we can have common parent classes, which we um, subclass and inherit. So we can reuse a lot of the functionality, even though the pipeline layout or design is totally different. And outside of this box, we have a lot of different things regarding MLOps, for example, and uh, data storage. So we have things like data lakes. The data sets could in turn point out different data lakes or S3 storage on AWS, for example. We have data versioning. We have, um, control, we have uh, version control tools and we have visualization tools to visualize the data sets, visualize the model evaluations and so forth. We might have GDPR registers, we have servings, and we have uh, dashboards and KPIs to monitor our servings. But that is all the things that is outside the scope of this box. So let's now go to the start of a project like this. When we first start out, a very common situation is that we have a bunch of, for example, GeoPython um, notebooks. And we have some kind of data engineer that is interacting and writing code in these GeoPython notebooks or it could, for example, be um, uh, scripts for the spider scientific ID. And 
notebooks is very nice for doing sandbox activities and interactive exploration, collaborative uh, feasibility studies and so forth. But my recommendation is that you should quite fast move on to um, something a bit more robust and rigid. And um, in the case of Python, I would say that you should go to a Python package uh, quite soon. And the last thing that we want to do now is to start an enormous project which aims to um, solve the full ML ops uh, pipeline uh, and environment in one step. That will be a long running waterfall like project where we won't get the feedback that we need from the engineers that are constantly working on it day to day. Instead what I would like to do is to start with a small, small increments where we base on what is the current state of the engineer's tools and then we incorporate it step by step and see how they are using it and reevaluate our design decisions along the way. So the first step here I would say is to make sure that we have their version control of the code. But then we should go on and move, move code into a Python package. And the reason that we want to move code here is both for reusability but also for testability. Because the problem with having a lot of code in GPython notebooks is that it's very hard to incorporate common CI-CD practices. So as soon as we have some code in a notebook and we find that it works good and it's something that we want to continue using, then we should move it into our um, Python package into a new model. And one of the benefits of doing this is that we can start writing um, unit tests for example. Unit test is something that is um, vastly un underused in the context of deep learning. There are other ways of testing your uh, deep learning training environments. For example you can try it in a small data set and make sure that it uh, actually converges and overfits the data set. But that will only tell you if you have a pr problem or not. It will not tell you where the issue is located. So by starting to write unit tests you can actually get faster development of the new models because you will find that the unit test directly points out which part does not work as expected. And we can also incorporate um, other parts of the continuous integration um, pipelines. So for example we can do our um, system tests before every commit is accepted to the git repository. So that system test could for example be to make sure that we can overfit a small data set. So let's address the elephant in the room here. The reason that most or many data engineers or data scientists don't want to use the Python packages is that once you start to move code from the notebooks into the Python package, it practically got um, frozen um, to the current state. It can make it very hard to 
um, continually improve on the code and test out um, new modifications to it and use it in an uh, iterative sense. So we need to have some extra um, interfaces and functionality here. Something like a very simple pipeline that can be used to run, run the code as a package. And we want to be able to run it in different um, kind of um, cases. So for example, both on our big data sets, our small data sets, and uh, in, in an interactive way so that we can use it during development phases and in a more automated way so that we can, uh, can uh, re rerun it on the same um, data if the code has changed or rerun it on the same code if the data has changed. So what we need here is some kind of CLI. So now the code can either be accessed by the data scientist for the CLI or by using the Python, uh, new Python notebooks that will in turn um, use the functionality in the Python packages. So when coming this far, I would say that one other thing that we might want to start factoring out is the data sets, making them more generalized and having them share a common API. And if we don't have it, by this time, we should spend time on getting data set versioning functioning. After this point, the next step could be the configuration. Factoring out the configuration from the scripts to a separate configuration file. And one of the benefits with having the configuration in a separate file is that it makes it very easy to look in the history in Git, for example, in the version control tool, to see what changes was made between different uh, deliveries or different uh, trainings. And it is also a prerequisite for the next step um, where we actually want to have different architectures as models that can be adapted later. And if this step is needed or not to extract the um, architectures in a more modular fashion so that we can easily change them and try different ones, um, that depends very much on the use cases. Some companies might um, find one architecture that suits them well and just stay with that one, while other ones might have a more um, large need to try different models for different kind of installations or different use cases. And in that case, of course, uh, making them more modular is much more important. And then finally, the last step going from here would be to have some kind of uh, um, model store or database for your models.
So once your models are trained, you put them in a model store and you have data lineage. So with data lineage, we mean that you should be able to look at the model together with the uh, evaluation statistics and so forth of the model and see what, what configuration was used, what architecture was used, what data was used, and what code was used. And once you have come to this stage, then I would say that the next step is to focus more on the peripheral parts of the ML operations, like deployment, monitoring of models in deployment, and making a feedback loop with constant new data coming in, evaluating the current models, um, evaluating new models, um, side by side um, model deployment and so forth. So there are some different options how to get to this state. Either you can go minimal and just implement something really simple and you can actually get a quite powerful environment with a really small amount of code if you just reuse some um, low level libraries. But you can also get there by adopting a framework that's already existence. So there is a lot of frameworks um, which covers quite a lot of, um, of the different uh, topics here. So for example, there is Pachyderm, there is Polyaxon, there is Kedro, there is MLflow, um, and so forth. So the downside of using uh, one of the large frameworks is that it might be a larger step for your data engineers to get familiar with the framework and a larger implementation effort to actually get there from what you're currently having. So it all depends on what does you have now and how is your time plan um, and goals. How much time can you spend on developing your framework compared to the day-to-day -day development of the product itself? And how, how, uh, what, are, what are your goals about how much your MLOps framework you need to have in the um, soon future? That was everything for this time. And the next time we will focus on the peripheral parts of the MLOps framework.